It's a little bit like Christmas. It's getting close, less than two weeks now. And today we're able to meet together again uh, in the building here. And we're going to be able to sing a carol. Uh, so that's nice too. Just as we get close to uh, Christmas, we're very aware of the reason for Christmas. We think of Christ coming from, he from heaven to earth, coming to be born as a babe, but why, for what reason, and over it all. And we know that it means his, eventually his death, his resurrection, return to heaven. We know all that, but over it all is the fact that he was reconciling God and man. We were separated from God, and the only way that we could be reconciled to him was by God coming down to us, reconciling God and sinners. And that was the reason why he came. A couple of verses just from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 18. This is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. All made possible by the coming of God to this earth, being born as a baby, and living here as a man, so that he could reconcile us to God. We'll sing those words. We're going to sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We'll sing it out. You can belt it out softly behind your masks, uh, but it does give us an opportunity to think very carefully about the words that we're singing and just to give praise to God as we sing uh, that indeed Christ came so that we could be reconciled to him. Let's sing together. We'll, we'll remain seated as we sing. Father, we do want that glory is brought 
to your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Because as we realize again that he came for us, it was for me, it was for each one of us, that he came so that we could be reconciled to you. And we just want to thank you for the lengths that you went to in sending your Son, and the lengths that he went to. The fact that you made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that we through him could become your righteousness. Oh, Father, as we think of this coming of Christ as a baby to Bethlehem, and as we think of God living amongst men, we praise you that we were ever able to be reconciled to you through him. Thank you so much for what you did through your son. In his precious name, amen. Welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. It's a wet day, uh, but thank you for coming. It's nice to have the fellowship together, just that we together, praise God, that we together uh, hear what he has to say to us. Um, so thank you for coming. Welcome also to those who are watching online. Uh, and we pray that each one of us will be blessed, spoken to, and changed just a little bit more uh, through our service this morning. Announcements, very few. Um, let me s t stress, Wednesday evening, 8 p.m., our prayer meeting, our church prayer meeting. Please put it as a priority there. I know there are busy lives. Don't miss out on being able to come together to pray, to talk to God uh, on Wednesday, 8 p.m., meeting here physically, or if you're not able to meet physically, there will be a Zoom link that you can be uh, with us on Zoom. Um, so make sure that as a church we come together to pray together. Uh, also, next week, next Sunday afternoon, we're hoping to uh, sing carols at Mary Curry uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You will have hopefully got an email a while ago uh, that asked just if you let us know if you're coming. There's a link there just to, put, um, to let us know that you're wanting to join with us. It helps with numbers. Uh, or you can contact Jonathan um, and let him know if you're able to be with us. That's next Sunday uh, at 3 p.m. at Marie Curie. And then next week, today, Drew will be bringing God's word to us, continuing in the series, Unexpected Christmas. Today, he will be uh, speaking on the angels coming to the shepherds and the message that they brought. Um, and next week, again, Drew will be with us on video again, and he will be speaking on the, the Magi, the wise men, the kings from the east, whatever you call them, um, and hearing what God has to say to us through Drew uh, next Sunday. I hope that's all the announcements. I don't know if I've missed any. Um, let's at this time, let's hear a message that Susan will bring to us uh, for the children. Uh, thank you, Susan, very much. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, um, in church and at home. Um, it is good to be here and good to, to see you. It's nice to see the church ready for Christmas with the Christmas tree. And I know that you know the story of Christmas very well. You know all about Mary and Joseph. You know about the stable. Um, you know that Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem because they had to be taxed so that the census could be counted and they were going to be taxed. And when Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem, I know that you know that there was no room for them anywhere to stay. And so they probably stayed in an animal holding area, a stable. Maybe it was a relative's, ho of a relative's home. Maybe it was a cave. We don't really know. We do know that there was no room for them. And we do know that the baby Jesus was born wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a feeding trough. The Bible says that that night, the shepherds were out in the fields looking after their sheep. And as Michael has just said, today we're going to think about the shepherds in the story of the Nativity. Maybe you think the shepherds aren't really important. Maybe you weren't impressed 
when you were chosen to be a shepherd. Oh, I'm just a shepherd. I'm not Joseph or a king. This is really boring. Maybe you just didn't think shepherds were that important. And you know, in some ways you're right, because at the time that Jesus was born, shepherds weren't very important. They did not have a really important job as far as um, other people saw it. But the shepherds have something really important to tell us about the story of Christmas. There were lots of shepherds in the Bible. Abel, Moses, Abraham, David. They were all shepherds. And shepherds back in the day of Abraham, they were really important. They were rich, wealthy people. Sheep were always wanted. Um, When the tabernacle was built and then the temple, shepherds were needed to look after sheep, which had to be raised for sacrifices. But over the years, things began to change. These important people, they decided, oh, they were too good to look after the sheep. So they got somebody else to look after the sheep. And then eventually the shepherds were pushed away outside the town and the sheep were looked after up on the hills outside of the town. The job of the shepherd didn't seem important anymore. It was a dirty job. Nobody listened to them. Shepherds were rough, rugged people. And even though the job they did was important, the shepherds themselves, they were not seen as being important at all. And I've been thinking a little bit about shepherds over the last couple of days. And I was trying to imagine, I wonder what it was like that night up on the fields. I wonder what it was like. Now, we don't know exactly what it was like for the shepherds. We know what happened there, but we don't know. So I was imagining, and I thought, let's imagine what it would be really like for one of the shepherd boys. So this is him. He's called Ben, or Benjamin. And I want to tell you a story about what happened to Ben that night. They had hundreds of sheep. They were quiet, except for the occasional bleat. Night had fallen. The stars were very sharp in the nippy sky. And the shepherds started to lie lie down on the steep hillside above Bethlehem, watching their flocks. The men talked quietly, with their low voices, were soothing to the animals. There were lots of older shepherds around the field that night. They had been there for a lifetime. And then there was Benjamin. He was only 16 years old. His father was further up the field. His grandfather had been a shepherd before him and his great-grandfather. Ben used to listen to the stories of the great shepherds of the past. Great men, but he knew only too well that shepherds today never amounted to much. No one thought highly of them anymore. Ben knew about David, a brilliant shepherd, Israel's greatest king, who had been a shepherd on these very hills a thousand years before. He, as a teenager, had defeated Goliath and beaten the Philistines. Ben longed to be part of something wonderful like that. But here he was, just a lowly old shepherd. And he was one of the younger ones. He really wasn't important. The shepherds began to quieten down. They tugged their heavy cloaks around them to shelter from the whistling wind. Their eyes had grown used to the blackness. And every now and again, they would look up and check were there wolves or thieves nearby because they weren't about to lose any of their sheep. When all of a sudden... Their hillside was flooded by the light of a thousand lamps, blinding them. When they could finally see, a man in shining clothes stood before them. Do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a deliverer has been born to you. He is the Lord's Messiah. The Messiah? The deliverer, breathed Benjamin. Has he come at last? They could scarcely understand. Great news, great joy in the town of David. The son of David is born tonight. The Lord's Messiah. Could this be true? The angel continued, this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. What a strange sign, but there was no time to think. The shining angel drew himself up to his full height and as he opened out his arms the radiance and the glory upon him began to spread until it covered rank after rank of angels the heavenly host the army of God himself more and more company after company 
Battalion after battalion began to fill the sky. And now they began to chant, to shout, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest and on earth to those whom God has favoured, peace. One of the shepherds, one of the older ones, spoke first. Friends, we are seeing what prophets only dreamed of. Angels breathed the youngest shepherd. The host of God's army, said Benjamin. Benjamin couldn't, Benjamin couldn't believe that the angels would come to tell them, lowly shepherds, the good news. Surely that was something for important people and kings to hear. But no, the angels came to tell them the news. Benjamin had longed for something amazing, to be part of something wonderful. And this was it. The shepherds made plans to leave, to head down the hill, to see the baby that they had just been told about. What excitement! Benjamin could hear some of the older shepherds saying, Get in, you stay and look after the sheep. Elias, you stay and look after the sheep. And he thought, oh no, I'm going to be told to stay and look after the sheep. But his name wasn't called. And he got to run down the hills to see the Messiah, the rescuer, the Son of God. He, a lowly shepherd boy, was going to meet the King of Kings. You know the story now, how the shepherds did find the baby Jesus in the stable, how they knelt to worship him, and how the kings came a while later to worship him too. But I wonder if you ever thought about why God gave the good news to those lowly shepherds. Good news, the good news of Jesus is for everybody, from the lowly shepherd to the mighty king, from the youngest and most insignificant to the oldest and greatest. The shepherds are not insignificant in this story. They tell us that God came for every one of us, that he came to rescue every one of us from sin and death. That is truly good news. Let's come to God in prayer. Father, thank you so, so much for this good news. Thank you for that time 2,000 years ago when that news came to those shepherds out in the fields and they shared it with Mary and Joseph as they met with them. Thank you for the good news that down through the years came to us. A Savior has been born to us. He is Christ the Lord. Father, we thank you for all that we have in you today through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, help us to appreciate, to understand more and better why he had to come, but the wonder of what he has done when he was here and the wonder of what he's doing in our lives even today. We praise you, God. We want that you are glorified for you, not just your wisdom and your greatness and your power, but for your love that you sent your Son that we could be reconciled to you. We need you so much. We recognize again, Father, how little we are able, actually able to do things. We try and control things, but somehow we find so much that is out of our control. But we thank you, Father, that we can come to you, the God who is in control, the God of heaven and earth, you know, you understand, you're at work, you're there, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Father, that you're there with those who are struggling today, some struggling with health difficulties, some struggling with relationships, some struggling, Father, just to seek to know your way in their lives. Some mourning today. And the mourning never seems to go away. Thank you that you're able for everyone. You're here for us. Thank you for your word. 
for speaking to us, even for today that we can hear what you have to say to us. And we do ask, Father, that uh, Drew will have been very aware of your help as he brings your message to us. But, Father, we pray for ourselves this morning that our hearts might not only hear but accept your word to us. Thank you for your word that God himself speaks to us. Thank you for that word that changes our lives, for that word as we understand it better, that helps us to live in a way that brings glory to you. That word that brings good news to all this world. And Father, we pray as your gospel goes out throughout this world, we think, Father, of some areas where we're not even sure how that gospel can get there. But you know and you care, just as you brought that gospel to us. And we pray, Father, that that gospel will reach the Tihama people in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. will reach those eastern Pashtun people in Afghanistan. will reach people here in our own island of Ireland, in South Donegal, and in other places. Father, we pray not only will that good news reach there that people will hear, but that hearts will be open to receive not only this good news, but to receive your Son as Savior and Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your good news. Thank you for your Son. Fill us with that awareness of him today as we hear you speak to us. For we ask this in the name of the one who came from heaven above, to come to bring us reconciliation with you, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Drew's going to bring God's word to us via video. Now, thanks. It's a joy to be with you again this morning. Thank you so much for joining with us and thank you to Michael for leading our service up to this point. Um, We're going to turn to God's Word together uh, and as we do you'll you'll know that throughout this Advent season, uh, which is a time for us to prepare ourselves to celebrate the arrival of Jesus, uh, then we're returning once again to some of these well-known nativity passages uh, that some of us might be so familiar with, but these help us to describe and help us to see the wonder of this history-shaping event. And as we've been spending time in the early chapters of Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, we've been examining how the first Christmas for for many of the individuals involved seemed to be a surprise. In many ways, it seemed like it was an unexpected Christmas for them. However, we've also been recognizing the reality that God had been preparing for this first Christmas for centuries. None of what unfolds in these nativity passages, indeed throughout all of history, none of what unfolds is a surprise for him, is unexpected for him. And so, so far we've, set, we've spent some time considering Mary's unexpected angelic visit uh, when she found out that she would carry this miraculous baby boy. Uh, last week then Jack helped us to navigate our way through Joseph's part in this story as he received not only the news of, news of Mary's pregnancy but uh, the angelic visit of his own uh, to help explain the significance and the truth of what was going on and who this baby would be. This week we're going to turn to the shepherds. Uh, And I wonder what comes to mind when you think of the role of the shepherds in the first Christmas in the nativity story. And no doubt for some of us, we're casting our minds back to the nativity plays and we can already picture the the oversized dressing gowns and the tea towels tied to your heads with with somebody's tie. Um, Maybe you can remember the angelic visit that the angels, sorry, that the shepherds receive uh, as they're tending their sheep outside Bethlehem. Um, Maybe we picture them as part of the nativity scenes that we make up Um, And and for some reason, in a lot of those nativity scenes, they seem to be carrying a sheep under their arm. Maybe that's just to designate them as a shepherd. Um, But I wonder if we're sometimes in all of that, are we sometimes at risk of downplaying the role of the shepherds? And I don't just mean in our nativity place, uh, but in our appreciation of the first Christmas story. Uh, And are we at risk of downplaying their significance, their place in it? You see, the shepherds, they're not just a sideline character 
or a group of sideline characters in the nativity or they're, they're not just there to help fill up the manger scene and um, they have an incredibly important role in the story uh, and actually they have a very clear and a very challenging example for those of us who follow see we're going to read about the account of the shepherds uh, which is found in luke chapter 2 uh, and we're jumping ahead a little bit in the story uh, so last week we left uh, the end of chapter 1 of matthew's gospel as as joseph is told to name uh, jesus the newborn baby then the start of Luke chapter 2 fills in a little bit of the detail of how, the, how this family came to be in Bethlehem. It's, it's the account of the census that was ordered to be taken uh, and everyone is demanded to go back to their hometown to register. And that meant that for Joseph he had to return to Bethlehem. Luke records in verse 4 that was the town of David. He goes on to say that he, Joseph had to go there because he belonged to the house and line of David again in verse 4. Uh, we learned that from Matthew as well last week. And so Joseph takes, is taking Mary um, on this big journey. Mary, who is quickly approaching her due date. Uh, and it's actually while they're in Bethlehem that the baby is born. We see in verse 6, the time had come for the baby to be born. And so Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And perhaps it all seemed a little unexpected. But remember, this is exactly what God had said would happen through his prophet Micah about 700 years earlier. So Jesus has been born. God in human flesh has appeared onto the physical stage of the world. And so now what? Now what is going to be the next stage? Who's going to find out the news first? How, how is the, the news of this baby to be born? How is that going to ripple out from this little town in Judea to the rest of the world? And into that setting, enter the shepherds. Can I invite you, if you have a copy of God's Word, to open it to Luke chapter 2. Um, if you don't have a copy of God's Word uh, in your home or with you, uh, please do let us know. We'd love to, to give one to you if you don't have one yet. Um, but these may well be familiar words for many of us, as we've said. Um, but I hope that you're able to hear them with, with fresh ears this morning as we come to this wonderful account. Luke chapter 2, we're going to read from verses 8 through to verse 20. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that had happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This passage contains... Uh, some of my personal favourite verses of the advent of, of the Christmas season, if you're allowed to have favourites. And it's the proclamation of the angel in verses 10 and 11. Do not be afraid. I give you, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Th these words seem to characterise so much uh, of what Christmas is really all about. It is good news. It is the birth of the Saviour, the Messiah, the Lord. And as I've said many times before, the, these verses show the reason for the season. That, that Christmas is a celebration of the gift of the Saviour to the world. That this is indeed good news. Uh, and these titles that are given to the baby, uh, to Jesus in these verses are so significant. That they show who this baby is. They show what he came to accomplish. He is the Saviour, the Messiah, the Lord, the angel declares. And these titles show that this baby in the manger, Jesus, truly is the Son of God. He is the Saviour. He's, he's the one who came to save, the one who came to rescue us from our sins. And we saw that last week as, as the angel explained to Joseph that he had to call the baby Jesus. And we're told in Matthew one twenty one because he will save his people from their sins. He is the Saviour. He is the Messiah. 
the anointed one, that, that, that royal term that shows us Jesus' lofty position. He's to be exalted. He's to be worshipped. He is the Christ, which is the Greek term for the Messiah. He is the one who is promised centuries ago. He is the one the Jewish, the Jewish people had been longing for, for generations. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord, the ruler over all things. Indeed, this, this term Lord was used throughout the Greek Old Testament in place of the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh. This is who this baby is, God in human form. He is the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. This baby is the fulfillment of everything that had been promised by God. And, and this is the God who was working out his salvation plan in his world. This baby is the one. This is good news. And we should indeed love this angelic declaration. And this morning, as we reflect on these great words, uh, in a sense, I, I, I want to zoom out a little bit and take into account this whole passage that we've read this morning and see it as one unit. You see, as I've been reflecting on these verses and preparing for this morning, I, I was struck by a sense of repetition that we find in these verses. Um, perhaps maybe we stop reading too quickly at verse 14. Uh, when the angel is joined by the great company of heavenly hosts and they sing their praises to God. It's, it's a wonderful place to finish and to pause and to reflect. But as we continue on from there, from verse 15 to 20, then we see the response of the shepherds to the news that they had heard. And, and if we take that point at the end of verse 14, start of verse 15, if we take that as the midpoint in this chunk of, of, of scripture, then I think what we're going to see are some striking similarities in the two blocks that fall either side of it. So from verses 8 to 14, verses 15 to 20, I think we see a lot of similarities that can help us. And sometimes I think it's, it's good for us to recognize when we're reading through scripture, we recognize these patterns, recognize these repetitions. The spirit has clearly guided Luke to write in this way. And so what, what might we learn through that? Very often when we see repetition in this way, it's because something is being emphasized for us or we need to take special note of something. Well, let me outline where, where I see that repetition taking place and then we'll move our way through these verses. As I said, I think the break is between verses 8 and 14, 8 to 14, and then verses eight, uh, 15 to 20. In a sense, it's the two scenes, the first scene in the field, and the second scene in the town. And we see in, at the start of, verses, uh, start of verse 8 that the angel comes to the shepherds. The angel comes, that's the activity that's happening there. The angel comes to the shepherds. And then so much is brought to the shepherds. They're brought this good news and this wonderful message. In verse 15, uh, 16, 17, 18, we see that the, the shepherds are the ones who are active now. They go to the town. They go to Bethlehem. They go to see this thing that has been spoken of to them. And so we see this activity at the start of each block of someone going to a place, particularly with a message. And then we see in the second block, we see the good news being declared. We've just heard that wonderful good news of the angel declaration today in the town of David, a savior has been born. And then when the shepherds go into the town, they also go and they spread the word about everything that they had been told. The good news is declared. And both sections seem to end then with this praise of God. In the first, set, in the first setting, the, angel, the angelic host join the, the messenger angel and they declare glory to God in the highest heaven. And the shepherds return glorifying and praising God. And so we see this pattern. Uh, th this repetition almost of how these two sections break down. And as I said, sometimes when we're reading that in scripture and we see that um, th there's something to be emphasized there by how that's happening. Well, what is the case here in this section? What's being emphasized? Well, in the middle of each section uh, is the amazing declaration of the good news. Uh, in the first instance, it's the angels declaring today in the town of David, a savior has been born. In verse 17, as we said, it's the shepherds that they spread the word concerning what they'd been told about this child. And in both settings, it's clear that this good news message that was brought was then meant to be passed on. This is not a, a private email. This is, this is not a closed group chat. This is a good news that was to be spread. As the angel said, this News will cause great joy for all the people. So all the people need to hear it. 
and we've already spoken about what this good news is. It's the news of the birth of the Saviour, the Messiah, the Lord. And as we mentioned earlier, this is such good news. And it is such good news because without this news, without the coming of the Saviour, without God's salvation plan, then we face an eternity separated from him. But with this plan, then we, have a, we await an eternity with him. Without this salvation plan, we face an eternity paying the penalty for the sin that keeps us separate from God. But with this plan, we face an eternity with him because that penalty has already been paid. Without this salvation plan, we face an eternity of his right and just and holy judgment of our sin. But with this plan, we face an eternity of giving him praise and glory and honour for his goodness and his rescue of us. This is amazing good news. This is indeed something to be declared, something to be shared. And this is the good news that we find at the, at the centre of these two little sections in this passage. But it's not just the centre of this these two little sections. This is the central theme of the whole of Scripture. This is the most crucial news that anyone can ever hear, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners like you and me. That's why we remember his birth every year at Christmas. It's why for many of us as Christians, we celebrate his birth, his coming, his dying, his resurrected life. That's why we celebrate that every single day. This is the good news. And Christmas is a good news occasion. And as I said, it's this good news of the baby who is born that we find in the middle of each of these little sections. But getting back to these verses, we can see that each of these good news sections, they're preceded by some activity and then they are followed up by God receiving praise. And so in verses eight and nine, we see the activity in the form of the angel coming to see the shepherds. And in verses 15 and 16, we see the activity as is the shepherds going to Bethlehem. Now, clearly these two events are not the same. You see the, the role in the shepherds, the role of the shepherds is very different in each case. And I want to take each one in turn. So verses eight and nine, let's read these words together. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. And then we have that wonderful declaration that we've read. And so we see here that it's the angel who's doing all of the activity. Uh, the shepherds are relatively passive in this encounter. They're, they're keeping watch over their flock at night. And then suddenly it's the angel who appears to them. It's the angel who speaks to them. It's the angel who brings the good news. And the, the shepherds simply receive all of this. It, it all happened to them. And this is actually a really important aspect of the Christmas story. And in some ways it fits with our theme of an unexpected Christmas. You see, the shepherds were recipients of this good news. They, they didn't necessarily seek it out. They hadn't done anything to deserve hearing this good news. They, they didn't receive it because they were perceived to be clever enough or important enough or somehow strategic enough, certainly in our minds. They, they received it because God graciously gave it. That's the only reason. They received this good news because God graciously gave it. We, we might expect there to be some kind of qualification or credentials for the shepherds to be the first hearers of this good news. But no, perhaps it seems a little unexpected that God chose this group of sheep watchers, but that's his gracious act to them and indeed to us. And in that gracious act, we see the pattern for how this good news would continue to be spread. You see, we live in a world that says that you you got to earn your way, that you got to work your way up to sit at the big table. The message is that, that anything of value doesn't come freely. And there are some settings in which that may be true. But when it comes to the good news of Christmas, indeed, when it comes to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is not the case. The point is, none of us deserved this first Christmas. It's not as a result of our own merit or our own goodness that God sent his son, nor was it the response to our looking for him that he sent his son. No, he was sent as a gift, a gracious and loving and sacrificial gift for each of us. Note the words that the angels use when they talk about this baby who had come. They say, and he says that a saviour has been born to you. 
the ESV states, for unto you is born this day. Jesus was a, a gift sent to us. And, and of course we see this again when we consider Jesus' death on the cross in our place. That, that God didn't wait for us to ask for it. He, he didn't wait for us to be deserving of it. He made the sacrifice first. Romans 5, these wonderful two verses from Romans 5, verse 6 and verse 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. We didn't deserve it. We were still powerless. We couldn't help ourselves. We couldn't earn our way into God's favor. We couldn't work our way back to perfection. No, Christ died for the ungodly while we were still powerless. And verse 8 goes on, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. God graciously sent his son as a gift. Not, not because we had deserved it or because we had earned it. And some of us really struggle with that concept, if we're honest, because the concept of receiving such a great gift that has been given to us is hard to grasp. In some ways, it's totally counterintuitive. It is definitely counterbiblical. But some of us would, would feel better if we could earn it, because at least then we would feel deserving of it. But the point is, we deserve the gift because of who is giving it. We deserve the gift because God chooses to give that gift. God has given the gift. It's not because of the worthiness of us to receive it. God has chosen to give it. And so even if we struggle to get our heads around why, how, then we have to trust that God is God. That he knows what he's doing. That his ways are best. And so he graciously gave his son. His son was sent to us. And so we've seen that the good news is at the center of this story. We've seen the activity of the angels in the first section. We've seen, uh, I want to now look at the, the activity of the shepherds in the second section. And then we're going to finish by thinking about the praise that is due. You see, the shepherds, they hear this wonderful news. They, they, they receive this gracious gift. And their lives are transformed by hearing it. This news that they hear, it makes a difference. And that shouldn't surprise us. Remember what the angel had said about this news that he was bringing, that it would cause great joy. This news has an impact. This news does something. And what was the impact for the shepherds? Well, let's read their, their response in verse 18, uh, 15 to 18. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. See, they hear the good news about Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, and they drop everything to go and find him. And not only that, then once they meet him, they spread the word. They, they generously share this good news. There's so much activity here in these verses that the shepherds do. They go, they see, they find, they spread the news. It seems that the lives of these shepherds were changed. The news of this baby, then, then coming to meet this baby, it shifted all of their priorities. I realize we're not, we're not told any more details about what happens to these shepherds or where they end up after this event. But what we are told throughout the rest of the New Testament is that the pattern of transformed lives is what follows the response to the gospel. People who encounter the good news of Jesus, who respond to his free gift of grace, their lives are turned upside down by him and for him. So whether it's the first followers of Jesus uh, who literally leave their livelihoods and everything they know to follow him. Um, maybe it's Saul, the, the great persecutor of the Christian faith, who, who encounters Jesus and becomes one of his greatest missionaries. Or, or just the countless stories that we see throughout the New Testament letters, particularly of the, the generous and gracious and sacrificial living that's modeled by the early believers as they do life together as church. In each and every one of these settings, the reality is consistent that responding to the good news of Jesus means a transformed life. And, and life is transformed 
not because you have to, not because there are no rules to follow, but, but because you are in such, you've been shown such immeasurable grace and love and mercy from God that you want your life to then be given back as an offering to him. It's because we respond to Jesus as our saviour and our Lord that, that we then give our lives over to him. He takes the reins. He has control. We want our wills to be bent towards his. Now, now that doesn't always mean that we have to give up our jobs, give up our homes. Now, sometimes Jesus does call people to do those things in service of him. But what it does mean for all of us who claim to follow Jesus is that in every situation we find ourselves in, every situation, in work or at home, in our place of education, wherever we find ourselves, we should seek to show and share the good news of Jesus Christ. This news that has eternally transformed us. And we do that so that others may know the joy that he brings, this great news that brings joy. And ultimately, we do this so that God would receive the praise that he's due. Now, I wonder how living this transformed life, I wonder how that practically looks for you. As you seek to follow Jesus in every area of your life, I wonder what that might mean. Maybe it's uh, the way you respond to some of the chat and work about Christmas and what it really means. Maybe it's the, the words that you use when other people seem to be being critical of someone. Maybe it's the priorities that you demonstrate to your children at home. Maybe it's the attitude we hold when, when our concerns and our anxieties regarding COVID, when they start to rise, what, what is our foundation? Maybe it's the willingness with which we can speak to other people about our faith. Maybe it's the manner in which we deal with financial difficulty and decisions. Maybe it's these or any other number of things. See, the reality is that in submitting to Jesus, we are submitting all of ourselves to him. We seek his way. We seek his heart for these things and for every other aspect of our lives until we reach our eternal home. See, the, the lives of the shepherds on this first Christmas were radically changed by the good news that came. And so if you have heard that good news, I wonder how your life is marked by it. Now I'm aware that sometimes speaking in those ways can sometimes evoke an unhelpful sense of, of guilt. Um, maybe we feel unworthy because we look at our lives, we examine ourselves and we realise and we appreciate all the areas in our life in which we seem to fall short of what we would expect a follower of Jesus to do and to live. But, but can I explain that, that that unhelpful sense of guilt, and there's maybe a right sense of guilt in that where we're, we're being convicted by the Spirit to change our priorities, but there can be an unhelpful sense of guilt that can become the motivation for why we want to change and why we want our lives to be marked more for the glory of God. You see, the motivation that we should have for allowing God's power to move in our lives, it's the Holy Spirit who is at work within us. And the motivation that we should have for releasing more of ourselves to his service is so that we give glorious praise to God. He's the one who deserve it, deserves it. That's, that's how these two sections end. That in verse 14, we see this great company of angels who join uh, the, uh, the messenger and they praise God by saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven on, on, and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. And then at the end of the shepherd's section in verse 20, we see the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. You see, the response of the angels and the response of the shepherds to this wondrous good news of the arrival of Jesus was praise. And for us, it's the same. We need to recognize everything that God has done and therefore rightly come before him and give him the praise that he deserves. And we do that by giving him our all. It's as a sacrifice of praise, an offering of praise that we give ourselves to him. Now, now we're going to focus on this idea of worship um, in a little bit more detail next week when we consider the Magi who come to visit the baby Jesus and bring their gifts to him. But it's important for us to appreciate today that not only do the angels praise, not only do the shepherds praise in response to this good news message, but so that is how we should respond as well. Praise is the right and fitting response 
to not only everything we've seen here, but for, ev for everything that we have seen God do in our own lives. That's how we respond to this good news. That's how this good news brings great joy when we live our lives totally spending ourselves to give praise to God. So whether it's with our voices and what we say and what we sing, or whether it's in our hearts as we and what takes priority there, or, or in our actions and in how we treat others, in, in all of our lives, let's give God the praise that he deserves. He is so worthy of it. So in these verses in Luke's gospel, we see some great things. We see the good news of the baby born, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. We see the activity of the angels, which reminds us that the salvation plan of God was initiated by God himself. It's an act of extraordinary grace and love that this baby comes to us. And we see the response of the shepherds when they go that on hearing this great news, their whole lives are, are impacted and they go, they see this new baby and that leads them to spread the word about him. And all of that leads to God receiving the praise that he so rightly deserves. So yes, in many ways, this first Christmas was unexpected for many. And, and in a myriad of very different ways, Christmas 2020 is going to be unexpected for many of us. But I pray that as you prepare yourself to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, that you would hear the good news of the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, born that you might know him, that you may marvel at the gracious hand of God who put this wonderful salvation plan into action, and that your life might be transformed by his spirit at work in you as you live your whole life to give him praise. This is the good news that brings great joy. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born for you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, we praise you for this good news, the wonderful story of that first Christmas. We thank you, Father, that you came that you humbled yourself to, to stoop into your world, even though, Father, we're the ones, humanity were the ones that messed it up, that had turned from you, that, had, that were living lives of sin, yet you came to us. And therefore, while we were still sinners, your salvation plan came into action. And so the baby born in Bethlehem would grow into Jesus, who would hang on the cross, bearing the penalty of my sin, so that I may know you, I may know forgiveness from sin, I may know fellowship with you, I may know your spirit and dwell in my life, therefore equipping me to live the life that you've called me to as I seek to obediently follow your way. Father, this is indeed, indeed, this is indeed good news that brings great joy. And I pray, Father, that in a year where joy seems to be sapping, in a year where hope has been fleeting, in a year, Father, where many of us have, have struggled to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Father, I pray that this good news that brings great and lasting joy would give us encouragement that you are still God, you are still in control, you are sovereign over all things. And so may we cling to you as our Saviour, our Messiah, our Lord. And Father, for for those of us who know you, would you help us? Would you help us to more faithfully and obediently follow you? Father, for those uh, who, are, who are listening in, Father, who, who maybe don't know you yet, God, I pray that you would um, give us the grace, give us the humility to lay our lives before you, to plead for your forgiveness, to confess those sins that put you on the tree. And therefore, Father, when we know your redeeming love, May we live our lives in, in a way that glorifies you and that speaks of you to other people. So equip us all, Father, to continue to be so captivated by this wondrous story that we show and share your love to the world around us. And ultimately, Father, we pray these things and we want to live our lives in a way that gives you the glory and the honour and the praise that you alone deserve. And it's in your wonderful name we pray. Amen.
Let's allow God to continue to speak to us. Uh, Even as we sing together, we're going to sing, The Lord is my salvation. Let's declare that to those who can hear us, uh, whether here or further. Let's declare it to God. The Lord is my salvation. And most of all, let's declare it to ourselves, to our own hearts. The Lord is my salvation. Just remaining seated, uh, let's sing that together.
As we come to the table to share communion together, we have this amazing opportunity where we can give to our Lord our salvation. We've been thinking about the gift of God to us and how Christ is that gift. But we have an opportunity now as we remember him with the help of the bread, and the wine, that we can give to him. Can we give him our appreciation of what he has done? That we understand just a little bit more and that we are aware just a little bit more of the incredible things he has done for us? We can give him our thanks for that. We can, if we step that bit further, give him our love, as we've been challenged to do, to give him ourselves. We have this opportunity to give that we appreciate what he has done for us. Let's just remind ourselves of the enormity of what happened there when Christ came to this world and then went to the cross. Romans 5.10 says, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We're together with God because of what Christ did. Ephesians 2 just brings out again, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Can we appreciate what has happened so that we could be reconciled to God? That he might reconcile us to God in his body through the cross. Being able just to tell God, that we appreciate just a little bit more what he did for us. To be able to thank him from our hearts for how far he went. Maybe even if the Spirit has challenged us today through God's word, we can give him our love ourselves. That he be the priority in every part of our lives. We have that opportunity. Let's just take a few moments in quietness that we can bring our gift to him. Father, we can never fully appreciate the depth of all that was done for us so that we can be reconciled to you. But Father, just a little bit more, we understand these are big things. Thank you for what Jesus did for us in the giving of himself, in the shedding of his blood, in the going to the cross. Thank you so much for that. And Father, we want to thank you for this bread and the cup that remind us 
of the depth of what happened there on that cross for us, that we might be reconciled to you. Thank you for helping us to remember. Receive our thanks, Father, we pray, from our hearts for your Son. We pray, Father, as some hearts would seek to give you this morning, as your Spirit has challenged us to give you ourselves, that Jesus indeed will be our Lord as well as our Savior. Receive our appreciation, our thanks, and our love, Father, for your Son as we take of this bread and this cup. For we ask it in his name. Amen. If you've brought bread with you, uh, you may take it now. And certainly if you have that appreciation that Jesus did this for you and have received him as your Savior and Lord, then join with us and thank him for that bread that reminds us of a body given for us. And again, if you have that appreciation of blood shed, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for the cleansing of our hearts, and you have received that cleansing, then let's take of the cup together. Let's take our uh, office bearers. We'll pass around uh, the cup, and let's take of it, and let's again just give thanks to him as we take of it. Father, thank you again for the greatest gift that we could ever receive from you, the gift of a Savior. Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word to us. Thank thank you for your Spirit speaking to our hearts. And Father, we just ask that you would receive from us that appreciation and thanks and ourselves. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you again uh, for being with us today. If I can remind you just again to um, carefully socially distance just to leave via the fire door here. I hope it's not as wet uh, now as it was as you were coming in. Thank you.